We're talking uh, with Frank Marshall, now of Surfside Beach, uh, Beach or City? Beach. In the Surfside South Beach, Side South, Beach, South Carolina. Very good. Uh, and this is a second interview. We did an original uh, one with him back when he lived in New Jersey. But, um, and he is a veteran of the Ripcord campaign and um, has additional material to add. So we are doing a reshoot here. Okay. All right. So Frank, start off with some background on yourself and to begin with where and when were you born? I was born in Philadelphia, downtown Philadelphia, around Leventon, Ontario, and grew up there. What year were you born? 1949. All right. All right. Uh, you grew up there. Uh, what was your family doing for a living then? Uh, my mother was a seamstress at uh, Picaran and Alfred. Alfred Angelo wedding gown. She was in the designing room and did she sewn the what the designers made. Mm -hmm. And my father was a truck driver and also played music, had a band, uh, country and western music, and toured all around Philadelphia with different groups in the 50 that were on the circuit, like Bill Haley was in the same circuit with his band as my father. Wow. All right. And your father was a veteran too, right? My father served in World War II. He was at Pearl Harbor when they got bombed. Okay. He and was in the 25th Infantry. All right. Uh, and, and was he a combat soldier or a support No, unit? he was a, a lineman. He ran the phone line out and he worked in the office with the clerk. He was the clerk's, they called him Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ran a lot of errands for the clerk, who was James Jones, who wrote the book, From Here to Eternity. And my father's all through the book. All the characters are in the book. It's a true, it's a fictitious story on true characters. Mm -hmm. My father was the original bugler at Schofield Barracks. And they wanted this other guy to come in. He was a boxer. They wanted him to box for the company. That's a true story. His name, his real name was Robert Lee Stewart. And James Jones changed it to Pruitt in the book. My father's nickname was Friday. And Friday, he gave him, <clears throat> he changed my father's name to Salvatore Clark. And he gave him the name Friday in the book. The nickname stayed, and mm -hmm. my father's all through the book. <clears throat> and they had Pruitt, who was, or Stewart, who they wanted to box. And since he was the bugler, they made him the head bugler, and my father the second bugler then. Mm -hmm. And then they got bombed there, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, did he stay in Hawaii during the war, or did he move out with the division? No, he went to Guadalcanal with him, mm -hmm. and that's where he got malaria, and he got discharged. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the end of his career, and he came home. And he was kind of sad about that because he wanted to stay in with the guys he knew, right. but uh, they wouldn't let him stay in some of them discharged them with a bare case of malaria. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, just out of curiosity, how does he wind up in a, in a country western band? And he's from Philadelphia. <clears throat> he recorded albums, and um, he always played the guitar in the army, and he picked it up in there, and he played with the guys, and mm -hmm. they would sing country. Okay. And he came home, and he still played country, and some in the neighborhood played country. And he got with this band that was touring, um, this high celebrity girl. Her name was Sally Starr. She was like the morning TV mm -hmm. cartoon girl that did the shows. And she had a bunch. She would tour around the city and Philadelphia, New Jersey. Um, they would play all the big country clubs and all that stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, now, for you, so did you stay in the city while you were growing up? I stayed in the city until I was drafted. We lived in a row home on Tioga Street, and uh, 
I dry, I had a 65 GTO and I would drive that around all the time and um, you know I was single to cheat. I didn't have a girlfriend but I had many dates so mm -hmm. um, we would just you know had a good time growing up dancing you know going to dances hot shops yeah. how'd cruising. you pay for the car I worked okay. I I would work when I was uh, 11 years old I was working at my uncle's my grandfather's beer distributor right across the street I would sort empty cases I would work in gross corner grocery stores and then I was a pin boy at the bowling alley and I would set the pins when somebody hit knocked them down I would jump in the alley and put them in the machine and pull the cord and the pins would set and I'd have to jump out of the way when the next ball came oh. down. All right. Uh, and did you finish high school? I finished. I graduated from Dobbins Technical High School. I had taken plumbing. Okay. And what year did you graduate? 66. Okay. And then did you go to work as a plumber or what did you do then? I worked as a plumber for about <clears throat> less than a year and uh, I didn't like it. So I went into printing because I had printing also in the tech school. I took a course in printing. Mm -hmm. So I worked as a printer running a multi-lift and uh, a small printer and then uh, I start doing some typesetting and uh, making plates and design. Mm -hmm. What they called uh, cut, copy and paste now on a computer. I used right. to do it all by hand in different ways. Yeah. All right. Uh, and were you doing that when you got your draft notice? Yes, I was. Okay. Now, when did you get the draft notice? Two weeks <clears throat> in between Christmas and New Year's, I got the draft notice okay. that I was going to be drafted. Okay. But two weeks before that, one of my best buddies from the neighborhood that I hung out with, he knocked on my door on a Sunday morning and said his father got us, in, me and him, into the Army Reserve. Mm -hmm. But we had to go right then and sign up and back in that day if you had connections and you got into the reserves you were very fortunate because it was tough everybody wanted to join the reserves so he said let's go and I said no explain for an outside audience what was what, why was it so important to get into the reserves you wouldn't be drafted and they were drafting you at the time with um, as soon as you turned 18, you went and signed up for the draft, mm -hmm. and then you would get your draft notice. If you were married, first they started with if you were married, you weren't drafted, and then it was married and one kid, mm -hmm. you wouldn't get drafted, and then two children. So they kept changing the way the draft worked. And the only way, real way to get out was if you joined the reserves, you wouldn't get drafted. You'd do six months or whatever the time was that you did your training mm -hmm. and then you would just go become a weekend warrior and go away once a weekend. Right. And the reserves in Vietnam for the most part never got called up. No, that, not that, at that time. That was the other part. There were a few reserve units here and there I think that went, but all, yeah, and that was part of it. The National Guard to a certain extent had it, it worked kind of the same way. And the timing of this, at the end of what year were you getting this notice? The end of 68. Yeah. And so you're right, right there at kind of getting to be peak time for casualties in Vietnam, uh, as well as the war getting increasingly unpopular. So there'd be a particular press to get in. But your friend, and so your friend says, get, get in the reserves, sign up right now, and you didn't do it. No. I said, no, I'll take my chances. Okay. And I left January 14th. I left for the military. Mm -hmm. I, got, I went down to... Uh, 401 Broad Street and left for training right from there. <clears throat> now, did you get a physical there? Did you have to, or had you done that earlier? No, I had done everything earlier. Okay. And I passed everything and so all I did was 401 Broad, they swore you in and then you left. All right. Uh, and where did you do, do basic training? Fort Bragg. We went to Fort Bragg from uh, Philadelphia down to Fort Bragg and I did my basic training there. All right, uh, and describe what basic training was actually like. But first of all, what happens when you get there? 
When I got there, the first thing they do is line you up, give you a haircut, give you clothes, set you in the barracks, and then you just start training from then on. You would go do all different type training. All right. Uh, now, was the in that first day there? I mean, did you show up during the day or at night or? I I can't remember exactly. We left in. Um, I'd say we left Philadelphia train station early in the morning, maybe 9 o'clock in the morning on the train and out, and then uh, got to Fort Bragg in, I don't know, maybe six, eight hours or so yeah. on the train. Okay. So it wasn't in the middle of the night when you were going in there or anything like no. that? No. Okay. Well, at some of the training facilities, sometimes it's immediately get off the bus, stand on the footprints, get yelled at, and that kind of thing. Was yours more casual than that? No, that was basically, it was pretty everybody screaming in your face and, mm -hmm. you know, yelling at you and acting like you're a nobody, you know, and trying to be tough, like a bunch of tough guys talking to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and how did you react to that? I, it didn't bother me. I kind of like knew it was going to be coming. Okay. So you'd heard enough about this sort of thing before? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and the actual training part of basic training then, what are you doing? They, they teach you, they start you right off, you know, a lot of classrooms talking about, you know, what you're going to do in Vietnam, how it is, <clears throat> what weapon you, they have and what you'll use, and then you go to on site training, you know, shooting the gun, gun ranges, and then they just continued taking you out on walks. You'd have to run, you have to walk, and uh, six mile runs were nothing to do. Okay. Were you in good shape then? I was in pretty good shape. Okay. I was skinny. I only weighed 120 pounds, 128 pounds, 5'8". Uh, so I was the normal type person in there, but Physically, I wasn't strong, but I was in good shape. But you could do the stuff you had to do. I had to do the stuff I had to do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, now, what about the kind of close order drill and marching and that kind of thing? Were they doing that too, or were they really focusing on combat? Everything. Okay. You went through a lot of marching, a lot of, uh, you know, drilling and a uh, lot with the weapons and the classrooms, they continue to teach you, you know, different things about the weapons and basic training. Okay. Uh, and then what about the discipline? How much was there and what did they do when you screwed up? It was all discipline. I mean, you had to do everything they say and you had to, you know, do it when they say it and they would come in and um, like a scare tactic. They were trying to just scare the hell out of you and just, you know, do what you're supposed to do. All right. Uh, and when, so when somebody did mess up, what would they do to them? Uh, basically push-ups, um, put them on detail, you know, mopping floors. KP was a big thing you had to do. If you weren't doing something right, you'd have KP. Okay. Now, did you get much of that? No. Okay. So did you have a strategy or how to survive, figure out how to survive? I just went along with the program and what everybody had to do. Okay. All right. How long was basic? I think basic in Fort Bragg might have been eight weeks. Yeah. It was pretty much the standard at that point. Now, uh, they were treating, was your whole class pretty much from kind of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, or were they from all over the place? Most of the people I was with were from Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, and now, when you came in, is there a point when they give you any options for what kind of training to go into next? Do you get any choices? I don't remember any, recall anybody having any choice. They, at the end of the training, they called your name and told you where you were going. Okay. Whether, what kind of training you would have next. All right. So what came next for you? <clears throat> Advanced Infantry Training, right. AIT. Okay, and where'd you go for that? Fort Dix. 
Okay. So training for infantry for Vietnam in New Jersey. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what did that training consist of? It's basically the same thing, but a little more heavier on it. Heavier in what sense? A lot more of it. In other words, you did a lot more of the drilling, you did a lot more of the uh, weapons, um, night courses, you know, you'd have, have to go out at night, set up camp, and how you'd walk under barbed wire and all that other stuff. Did they make any effort to simulate conditions in Vietnam? Uh, they tried to, yeah. The training I got, though, was nothing like Vietnam. Okay. Some places had sort of mock Vietnamese villages or fake booby traps or things like that. We didn't have that. Okay. We had some similar, but nothing like Fort Polk and all them other places mm -hmm. were really heavy on it. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, while you're in at Fort Dix, uh, did you get to go home? I think I went home one weekend okay. out of it. Because it was M4. Yeah. All right. Uh, was that another eight weeks? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, at the end of that, what happens to you? I got orders for, I was drafted into the NCOC course. Which is? Non-commissioners, non-commissioned officers training. Right. Where they, they give you stripes after you're out. Okay. Now, what was the point of putting someone fresh out of training into a non-commissioned officer school? Why were they doing that? They needed, they needed sergeants over there. They needed people with more training to lead other troops. Because mm -hmm. at this point in Vietnam, a lot of the more experienced sergeants, uh, if they re-enlisted at all, went into some other part of the army, so they didn't have enough combat leaders so the the infantry, probably. So they had to make them this way, uh, and so you do that. Now, where did you do that training? Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. And what did the course consist of? Uh, a lot of training, a lot of. Now I, I went home for a leave first, and then I went to Georgia, and uh, the training was pretty intense, and the and the end of it was. Uh, Ranger, a short course on ranger training. Mm -hmm. But the word going around was that if you failed this course, they sent you to Germany as a dog handler. Okay, they okay. trained you, you go to Germany if you failed. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be the best time for me to fail. And I wanted to fail bad. And they kept passing me. <laughs> and I did the ranger training where they went up a, you had to climb up a telephone pole, and then you had to walk another telephone pole, and then you had to grab a wire over a lake and go over the light, uh, wire and then hit the ranger tap. So when I got up to the top of the telephone pole, I found out I had uh, fear of heights and the whole world starts spinning around me, so I wouldn't do it, and I said, I'm going down. Well, everybody else is coming up behind me, so <laughs> they weren't too happy, and I came back down. I said, I'm not doing it, and I thought they would fail me, but they said, nah, you're pretty good. We're going to pass, and I didn't want to, and then I talked to some people, and you know, I did not take my, I did not accept my sergeant stripes. Okay. So you essentially completed the course. I completed the course up until about two days before the end. All right. Now, did they do all of it at Fort Benning or did they send you around to other places? No, it was all at Fort Benning. Okay. All right. So you weren't actually going to the ranger school, per se? Or yeah, it was just a quick course. You, you do yeah. a couple things that the rangers did. Okay. All right. So after all of that, uh, and, and so now that you've uh, declined to become a sergeant, now what do they do with you? Then they sent me on a leave and sent me to Vietnam. Okay. How did they get you to Vietnam? I went back to Fort Dix and got a plane and went to Fort Dix. I went home for, I think, 30 days, mm -hmm. 28 days, whatever it was. I had to leave. Right. 
And then I went to Vietnam. Okay. And did they send you on military aircraft or chartered civilian aircraft? No, it was uh, from Fort Dix. It was a regular airplane. Okay. <clears throat> but I went over with a lot of guys that were going back to Vietnam. Okay. And did anything, any of them say anything to you about it? Uh, they were in the back shouting, you know, uh, calling us cherries and yank, you know, you might not come home. And they were being real wise ass. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Vietnam, they sent us to Long Bin, and as they were processing us in, the guy, the group of guys that was on the back of the plane making all the noise, they were clerks <laughs> doing the paperwork in the rear. Wow. So when they were yelling, they, they knew they were coming back home and all this other stuff. They were the accounting clerks. They were rims. All right. Now, uh, so when do you actually land in Vietnam? October 8th. 69 now. Of 1969. Okay. Now, along the way, while you were doing the different kinds of training and things like this, had you now started to pay attention to news from Vietnam, or did you just tune all that out? No, I kind of tuned everything out. I just kept thinking I wasn't going to go, the war would end, and with the protests and everything else, that, uh, you know, there's no possible way I'd be going to Vietnam. Okay. And now here you are. So, so what was your first impression of Vietnam? When I got there, um, I still was kind of like blank. I didn't know where I'd be going. I didn't think I'd have too much problem. Okay. But just sort of, I mean, physically, I mean, a lot of guys talk about getting off the plane. They notice the heat or the smell or something else, uh, or was just getting off the plane. And I got off the plane and everybody was around and, you know, people were walking, you know, all the veterans and everything. And I was down south in Long Bend at the airport down there, so I didn't think any, I didn't think much of it so okay. far. Yeah. So it wasn't in a place where anyone was lobbing mortar rounds at you or... I felt pretty any, safe. Anything, anything else like that, okay. Uh, so now that you're at Long Bin, um, what happens to you? How do they process you? They process you in, uh, take your name, you know, you have to go to a roll call in the morning and they say we'll send you We'll tell you when we call your name and tell you where you're going. Okay. All right. And then you would have the day to do detail. Because then they would call your name and they would pick you and you would do detail all day. Which means? You burn shit. Okay. Or you KP. Whatever they made you do, mm -hmm. there'd be a group of guys that were the, like the sergeants that would be the head of the... Uh, group that you're supposed to do detail with mm -hmm. and then they would ask you to pay a couple dollars they would say alright give me two dollars and you don't have to go to detail and then they would pay the Vietnamese people half of what you gave them to do the detail for you okay so I did that for about three days or so All right. until they called my name now, during this time, were you figuring out maybe which unit you did or didn't want to join? Uh, different people would tell me, as long as you don't go with the 101st up north, you'll be fine. Okay. They're the only ones fighting right now. So I, I just kept it in my head that as long as I go somewhere without the 101st up north, I'll be okay. All right. So, where do you go? They called my name, 101st. Up north. All right. Uh, and so now, how do you get up there? Um, C-130 maybe took me up to uh, Fubai. Mm -hmm. And then from Fubai, I got on a truck and went to Camp Evans. Okay. All right. And Camp Evans was the headquarters of the 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division. Yes. And the divisional headquarters is at Fubai, or Camp Eagle sometimes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're at, at Camp Evans. Uh, now, once you arrive there, what do they do with you? I got to the company, and uh, they assigned me, you know, an M16 and 
all the stuff from my rucksack and told me I'd be going out to the company. Okay. So which company are you joining? Alpha Company. Of what unit? Second of the 506. Okay. So second Battalion, 506 Regiment. Okay. Uh, so, and where were they at the time? You had to go out in the field to join them. What kind of area were they in? They were somewhere up north, mm -hmm. okay, uh, in the mountains. From what I understand, it was October 23rd, I think, or October 26th. Well, I have it marked down, but um, they were just on an LZ. And so I packed my rucksack, and I didn't really know how to pack the rucksack. It was like weighted down. Uh, they gave me a case of sea rations, and I took everything that was in the sea ration box mm -hmm. and put it in my rock. A poncho, a poncho liner, uh, all the ammo they gave me, the grenades, the smoke grenades. I had everything, and I was loaded down, and it had to be 150 pounds. Weighed more than I did, and I could hardly carry it. Were you actually supposed to take the whole case of sea rations? No. They should have told me then what to take and what not to take, mm -hmm. but there was nobody there telling me anything. I just packed it. Now, between the time that you went up to Camp Evans and you went out in the field, did you get any kind of training or orientation at Camp Evans? Uh, or for that matter, Fubai, I mean, did you? It was in Fubai. I okay. took another, I took a, I think it was probably a week of P training, they call it. And I did repelling, they teach you repelling and, you know, night training and uh, different stuff like that. More, better training than they taught me in the, the rear, right. back in the States. Because this is now learning to do the things you would actually do if you're in the division. Yes. Although, did you do much repelling? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so there's, yeah, because there the division ran its own little school. Sometimes I think they called it search training or something like the that. The search training is what it was, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you had done that, and that's sort of the, the time gap between when you first got to Vietnam, you go out in the field uh, later in the month of October. So you're on a landing zone, uh, you join up with... Uh, not so fast. Okay. Now I got my rucksack on and I'm loaded, and I get on the helicopter, and I happen to be sitting on the door of the helicopter. And as the helicopter is starting to land down towards the LZ, I looked around at the men that were on, from Alpha Company that were on the LZ. They had growth, they, they weren't clean shaven, they had hair over their ears, their clothes were all muddy, uh, they looked very Hardcore, mm -hmm. and I looked at them, and that's when it all hit me. Like I do, I was all clean clothes, all brand new clothes, and that's my first feeling that I was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at them, and I was staring at them, and the door gunners yelling for me to get off. And I said, you know. I, I, I can't do this. I, I was kind of like frozen. And he's yelling at me to get off. And one of the guys that was on the LZ came up to grab my hand. You know, like, come on, we're yeah. getting out of here. And they got me off the helicopter. And he took me over to the side of the ravine. It was like a four foot ditch. And he pointed out and he said, look out there, straight ahead. If you see anybody, shoot because they're enemy. Now I'm really feeling like this is not where I want to be. I don't want to be here. And that's within a few minutes of getting off the helicopter. The next helicopter that came in, I heard it coming in. And then I heard a bunch of racket and then a bunch of crashing. And Something hit me in the back, and I jumped into the ravine, you know, I fell into the ravine there. And it was like maybe three, four foot drop. And when I got up, I looked, and everybody's running around. The helicopter that was landing, the skids got caught in underbush. 
and it was trying to level itself. <clears throat> and two of the guys jumped off. The helicopter then immediately swayed over this side. Those two fell off, and the two guys in the middle either jumped off, somehow got off the helicopter. That meant there were six guys that off the helicopter while the blades were going like this. It chopped up six guys into pieces. And when I got up off the ravine, I looked, there was a guy's head and a two-quart canteen. One of them hit me in the back to throw. When I looked at that, now this is the third thing. Within five minutes, my first time in the field, I just didn't think I was making reality check. I mean, this was not where I wanted to be. And then we had to clean up all the pieces. Mm -hmm and <clears throat> all the body parts and everything, put them in bags and walk around and do that. And then we left the area. And as we were going up the mountain, I got over 180 pounds on my back. I can't walk. And I'm falling back of the platoon. And that's when one of the sergeants, I, I forget who it was, one of the guys grabbed me and he went through my rucksack and took half the stuff out and said, you can't take this, you can't take that. He gave my poncho jacket to somebody else to throw back on the next helicopter to th go back to the rear. He took a bunch of stuff, said, you don't need this, you don't need that, you don't need this. And then my rucksack was a lot lighter, and we continued to walk up a muddy, muddy, slopey hill. Mm -hmm. And we set up for the night. And you were starting to look like them? Uh, I was starting. I was starting to get muddy, dirty, and I felt like I'd been there for a year, and I was just shaking. It, it was not where I wanted to be. Okay. Um, so, over the, the next few days, do other do they try to kind of teach you the ropes, or do you just follow and do the best you can? They would just, I, I just had to follow. I just, come on, we're going up here, we're going there. All right. Then they, <clears throat> about three days later, they said, okay, you're going to walk point. Well, I have no sense of direction. I never know where I'm going, even to this day. And I had the M16 rifle, and I'm going to walk point. Well, I kept going off course from where they wanted me to go, and I wasn't walking point as good as they wanted me to walk point. So they started screaming at me and sent me back to off point. And as they were doing that, one of the guys that was uh, killed on a helicopter must have been the M79er because they said, we need somebody to carry the M79. It's going to be you. Okay. So they gave me the M79 at that time. So you've now got the grenade launcher? Grenade launcher. Right. Okay. Had you trained with that? I shot it a few times. I didn't know what I was doing when I shot it a few times. So I carried that. Now, a couple weeks later, in November is when I got my first firefight. Uh, there was somebody shooting at us from above. So I got to 79. It's my first firefight, and I get down on the ground, and bullets are passing my ear. And they said, send up the 79. Then you hear, send up the 79. Down, daisy chained in. And when it got to me, the guy ahead of me said, send the 79 up. They went the 79 up there. And I went, okay, here. <laughs> and I handed them the 79. Well, now they're screaming and yelling at me, calling me all different names. And telling me, no, I had to take it up there. So I had to go up front, and then I had to shoot the 79 where they wanted me to shoot it. Okay. And that was basically my first firefight. All right. Now, aside from that, the helicopter incident at the very beginning, how, how long was it before you 
period. So any casualties? You know, had your a couple weeks, okay. ten days maybe, mm -hmm. not even. I mean, after the M seventy nine incident, or or did that happen before you were called up? Well, the helicopter crashed right. on I think October twenty six, yeah. <clears throat> and then they had me walk point about three days later. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they gave me the M79, and maybe two weeks after that is when I got into my first firefight, right. and two of the guys were killed on okay. that day. Okay, so that, that is the same day then. All right. Uh, okay. Now, um... Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just shut it off. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, let's see, were you, you were, and you were still operating in Hill Country at this point? Yes. Okay. Uh, and now, did you stay in that area for a long time, or did they move you now somewhere else? We were going up and down different mountains night and day, and uh, I just want to shut this. Right. I don't know how. I'm not very good at phones. I think that's it. Yeah. You and me both. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, so you, you, but it's still kind of up and down d different hills, red lights. Were they moving you around by helicopter from one place to another? Sometimes, sometimes, not very often at that time. Mm -hmm. It was basically walking around. Okay. Uh, were the were you gradually getting accepted into the unit while you were doing this, or were you still kind of just a new guy? <clears throat> no, it was. Most of us were pretty new at that time. And the older guys that were left, that were still there, uh, we seemed to get along pretty good. Okay. I was getting along good with them. All right. Uh, do you remember who your platoon leader was at that point? At that point, I don't. Okay. Do you remember who your company commander was? Uh, Felliter, Captain Felliter. Okay. Uh, and then that... And then he will rotate out at some point, right? Or yes, he left in Burkhardt. Captain Burkhardt came in, Albert Burkhardt. Right. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay. So basically, just to kind of continue with the story, you've, you've seen your first fire fight, you're kind of ad adapting to the unit and just being in it, and, and they're getting used to you. Uh, now, so kind of what happens to you next that kind of stands out for you? Um... We basically walked around the mountains, different things like that, until February. Uh, we went to Firebase Jack for a while, and we were on Firebase Jack, which was in the flatlands, mm -hmm. and pretty safe. Okay. We did a lot of repelling on uh, to build a. It was called a LZ Cutting Team. Mm -hmm. I was on that, and we repelled down on the mountaintop and cut an LZ. And then they would fly in, pull us out. Okay, so that just kind of go fly up into the hills and practice, and then just come back. So you weren't actually landing units on the LZ; you were just practicing cutting. We would cut the LZ so they could land somebody on. Okay. It. Okay. All right. Um, and that, that was just men selected out of your platoon who got to do that, or? It, yeah, it was people in the company. Like in other words, they would say, "Okay." You, 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 you're on the LZ cutting team. Okay. Somebody would come down with a saw, somebody would come down with, uh, and, you know, the ropes, uh, you know, whatever we needed, axes and everything else to cut. Okay, so you weren't using explosives? You'd have C4 if you needed them. Okay. Because I've had engineers describe doing it and using most of the explosives and C4 and jet cord and things to, to knock trees down with. Uh, but that's they would use it yeah we did basically with uh, hand by hand okay so hand saws not chainsaws chainsaws well you had chainsaws yes okay. so you weren't trying to surprise anybody no I never understood that at all I mean you would go down there you would cut it and you would get out of there mm -hmm. okay uh, and Around Firebase Jack, were there any VC? Were there any North Vietnamese in the area? No, I don't think so. I think it was pretty safe. Okay. All right. Now, um, how long did you stay at Jack? A couple weeks. Okay. Might have been maybe three weeks. 
And from there, do you go back to Camp Evans or someplace else? <clears throat> we went back to the mountains somewhere. Okay. We went back out for a while, walking up and down mountains. We got into a lot of firefights here and there, or um, I don't recall too much in between mm -hmm. Jack and March 12th. Okay. All right. But it was a sort of a routine kind of existence in a way. It wasn't a lot of heavy fighting, but just skirmishes here and there. I would say skirmishes here and there, and a couple people killed. Um, some people say we were in a lot of combat at that time, but I don't recall it. Okay. All right. Uh, so now talk about March 12th then. March 12th. We, I thought we went into the Camp Evans, reloaded, and then flew out. Mm -hmm. But they're telling us that no, we went from the field. Okay. So I can't recall which exactly that we were supposed to have done, but we loaded up and we flew out. And March 12th, it was like, God, it had to be 25, 30 helicopters in the sky. And we were going up towards the north um, on the mouth of the Ashaw. And we were supposed to fly into, I think, 902. Mm -hmm. And while we were midair, they changed what hill we were going to. Mm -hmm. Now, they had prepped this hill with B-52s, bombs, napalm, where we were going to land. Then in the middle of the decision, they decided, no, you're going to go over here to this other hill, 937 or whatever it was, which eventually became Ripcord. Mm -hmm. And we landed on that hill. And the first company, the first, there's two platoons that went in there. When I was landing, I was in fourth platoon. And we were landing, uh, it was green smoke out, which meant friendly. And by the time we were landing, red smoke was popping. And I could see the red smoke popping, which means it's a hot LZ. So there's someone shooting at you. Yes. And I could see dirt flying from the mortars hitting and machine gun fire from the bullets flying all around where we were landing. I was in the center of the helicopter at that time. And the two guys on my side of the door where we were getting off, they got off and ran to the big rock, the split in the rock. And I got off and I'm on the ground and they yell, you know, come over here, there's room. And I got up to run to them and the mortar hits the rock and wounded the two of them. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> right away, another helicopter's coming in and they yell to help carry them onto the helicopter. So I dropped my rucksack. Now I got the M79, I got my rucksack on and I got my vest for the M79 rounds. So I had to drop the rock and <clears throat> kept my M79 on, but I helped pick up Westerfeld and put him on the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And just then as I put him on the helicopter and I'm coming down, my sergeant grabbed me by the, you know, back and said, come on, we're going down here. And we went down the side of the hill to try to knock out the machine gunner. And they needed me to do that. And when our squad walked, ran down the hill to take cover, <clears throat> I broke my 79 open to put a grenade in, and I got no grenades on me. I left them at the top of the hill mm -hmm. with my vest. So everybody's screaming at me again. And my sergeant said I had to run up the hill to get it. And as I'm running up the hill, everybody that was down there told me they thought I'd be dead because the machine gunner was shooting at me. And as I'm running up the hill, <clears throat> they're watching me and they're telling me that they couldn't believe how I was zigzagging and going down and up and everything else as this machine gunner was firing at me. And I had to tell them the truth that I wasn't zigzagging, I was tripping and I was falling. And as I'm running up the hill, 
I kept sliding and falling, so it wasn't that I knew what I was doing, it was... Yeah, because it wasn't as if it was a nice clean path to walk up or a road. You had to scramble up the side of a rocky hill. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, but you managed to retrieve I got the, stuff? I got my stuff and ran back down, and when I was ready to take out the machine gunner, and I had my sights on him, the Cobra gunships came in at that time and took them out. So. All right. Now you're at the bottom of the hill. Does the you're gonna go, do you go back up to the top or? We went up? back up to the top. We were on the side at that time, but then we went up back up on top. Okay. And how long did you stay there? That is a little tricky for me because I, you know, at that point again, that was my big heavy contact down mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And the adrenaline's flying, and I'm, you know, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. And they were moving us around. We got off the hill, okay. but I think one company stayed, one platoon stayed up there, but ours went down, and we were riding, running around the area for a while, a couple of days. Okay, because ultimately the that operation gets called off. You landed there, but then they're taken out. You don't actually stay. Nobody stays on top of Ripcord at that point. No, we we did not take the hill. All right, uh, and then so that's that's March twelfth, and then I guess after that there were they wanted to go back, but there were weather issues. Bravo. They, yeah. they were having a pro uh, a problem with that. And then on April 1st, April Fool's Day, they put Bravo Company in. Bravo Company got hit real bad. All right. And where were you when Bravo Company went up? I was somewhere around there. Um, there was a team that went up to help Bravo Company. I don't recall me going with them. Okay. People have told me I was there. <laughs> um, a lot of things are sketchy in the sense when I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I was totally scared. From March 12th on, I was scared every day. And, and a lot of things just don't flicker. Everybody's got a different story. You can hear the story from 10 different guys and you'll hear 10 different stories. Yep, that is happening. And if I said I wasn't there with them and others told me I was. But I do know right after that, I got out of there. Because March 12th, I sat there and I told the CO and the uh, RTO yeah, from CP, from the command post with us on March 12th, that I wanted out. I wanted to go home. I wanted to take my R&R. &R. So <clears throat> they gave me my R&R and, &R and I left sometime in April, okay. April 7th or April 11th, I got out. All right. A little before that, as I understand, and they were Bravo Company, they're up on top of Ripcord, but the fire is bad, they don't stay there either. They go off the top of the hill, and at some point they pay your company a visit. Do you remember that? No, there's a lot of different stories about that too, about how they stayed with us and how we were not, we didn't want to go over to them, and I don't recall any of that. I, it, to me, that sounded like a bunch of BS because they were saying, like, uh, uh, Captain Burkhart wouldn't do this or that. Uh, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to guys from Bravo Company that say, you know, no, but I, I can't recall it. So okay. I can't yeah. get But it you don't really remember any particular interactions or them coming and passing through your position or. No. Staying with you overnight or whatever. Okay. Uh, I get to talk to Captain Burkhart, so and that's in his diary, so we will come. Yeah. There. Yeah. All right. Uh, so you remember, okay. But then, okay, so you go to R&R. &R. Uh, where did you go? Taipei, Taiwan. Okay. Uh, and what was it like to get out of Vietnam? Beautiful. I had a good time. I just partied up, and the seven days I spent in Taiwan, I just... I didn't care about nothing. I just, you know, had a good time. Mm -hmm. And then you had to go back. Then I had to go back. And when I went back, uh, it was the same thing all over again. 
it's like I never left. I'm mm -hmm. just right back into the, you know, we're walking and doing stuff that I didn't think was, you know, too cool. I mean, it, you know, it just stuff we were doing seemed stupid to me. All right. Um, do you remember some of the guys you were serving with at that point, either the officers or the guys in your squad or uh, the people who were your friends at that point? My squad, I'll remember for the rest of my life. Um, Sergeant Coger was our squad leader. We had uh, Ron Janasik, uh, had a guy Tiny, he was the machine gunner. Uh, big guy, Jim Anderson, mm -hmm. Joe Evans, he was a point man, uh, Tommy Agon, uh, another point man, uh, Tommy Webster was there. Um, so we had, a, we had a good squad mm -hmm. and we stayed together and we worked with everybody. And do you remember any of your platoon leaders? Uh, not really. I. I kind of forget who was the, our platoon leader at the time. Well, they tended to come and go. Yeah. Sometimes not voluntarily. Uh, yeah. The, the lieutenants, we lost, we had, uh, before Ripcord, I had uh, Lieutenant Wilcox, mm -hmm. who I thought was the best lieutenant ever. I had Lieutenant Kelly on March 12th, I think. It was. Mm -hmm. I had, no, I had Dudley Davis, was a new, Lieutenant on March 12th, mm -hmm. and he got killed March 12th. Mm -hmm. Then uh, they put me with Lieutenant Kelly, I think, for a while, mm -hmm. and they divided up the company again into three platoons, got rid of the fourth platoon. Right. So we had Kelly for a while. Mm -hmm. Then I had I had Tim Juliet for a while. I mean, they seemed to switch on us yeah. where we were born. Yeah. Well, Wilcox got promoted, so he, he had already had a year in before he got to Vietnam. He's a first <laughs> lieutenant. When he becomes a captain, he can't be a platoon leader anymore. So he goes out for that. Yeah. Um, but he went to Charlie Company. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole different story. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so they're coming. So it really, the core group for you is that squad. Yes. And those are the guys that, that you know. And, and Now, when you were out in the field, did the company normally move as a unit or would platoons go separately? Usually platoons. Okay. And would they be within some reasonable proximity of each other? So they Most of the time. Okay. All right. But you weren't doing really squad level patrols? Very rarely we do a squad. Sometimes we take the squad over to the, you know, maybe a little bit over here. Yeah. And so you're now looking at sort of late April and May in June of 1970. Um, was that pretty much all the same, or did things seem to be changing over time as you get closer to July? We were getting hit a lot. And May and June, we lost quite a few. We went up one to a rally for a while, I think in June. A stand down or? No, we were uh, security for a fire base. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Oh, oh, O'Reilly, oh, oh, not a rally. O'Reilly. Oh, yeah, so we got to O'Reilly for a while. Okay. Uh, and then we were there for a while, and then July was really scary. Um, okay. We know Ripcord's getting hit heavy. Okay. So just to back up a little bit, uh, you mentioned you had Captain Burkhardt, but he gets replaced at a certain point. Captain Hawkins came in and took over. Okay. And do you remember, was that in June or May? Or May, May, I think. May, yeah, okay. April or May. All right. What impression did you have of him? I didn't see much of him. Okay. I didn't, I reacted, I was just, I was the low man on the totem pole. Yeah. I didn't talk to anybody but my squad. Mm -hmm. And the only time, uh, and my squad, Depended on who I was walking, whether pulling security, what it okay. might. So the captains aren't making that much of an impression on you at that point? Not yet. Okay. All right. Uh, but basically, so, so, you're, so you're just taking casualties, you're running into the enemy. Did it feel like you were running into more of them over time? More and more every day. Okay. All right. 
And then once you get to the beginning of July, that's when the regular bombardment of the Ripcord base starts to happen, mortars and other things. Um, and you guys are still out in the field? Yes. Okay, now, before we kind of get to the climax of, of, of the story, you know, around July 22nd or so, what things do you remember going on in July that kind of stand out for you? From in July, everything we did, where we went, <clears throat> now we're starting to get aggravated because we know we're passing NBA <coughs> and shooting them. Killing NVA all around us. And we all knew there's a ton of NVA around us. They have us surrounded, basically. I mean, wherever we walk, we see NVA. Mm -hmm. And they're not they're not counterattacking us. They're not coming back at us. And it just felt very strange to me and a lot of us. Like why why are we down here, number one, with such little support? And we see so many NBA around us, and we're killing them. Why isn't the NBA coming back? Are they just one by one? You know, are they just a couple guys walking in the woods that nobody else knows they're missing? Mm -hmm. So it got kind of like, what the hell is going on here? Now, some of the other companies run into a good deal of trouble. I mean, Charlie Company got hit on Hill 902 at the beginning of July. Um, the, some of the 2nd Battalion of the 501st Regiment comes into your area. 805. And, yeah, and, and, they went, and one of their companies is on Hill 805, uh, and, and they get hit hard, and they have to stay there for several days and, and become a target. Uh, now, did your was your company operating in support of them at some point? We were, <coughs> we went in Charlie Company. We weren't support. No, no. Um, Charlie on their own. But, but on eight oh five, we were support, yeah. and we were there at night watching them get fired on, mm -hmm. and we were trying to fire back on them. And that's what I'm saying. Like all these other yeah, yeah. companies are are getting hit. Nobody's bothering yeah. us. You were there, but you weren't the target. Of course, you weren't on top of the hill. Right. Yeah. We were all in the valley. Mm -hmm. And when they wanted to go down in the valley, I was one of the guys that objected to it. Because I said, you know, like, why would we go down in the valley? And a couple guys were trying to say, you know, like, it's not right. And I have a different story than anybody else because I know a bunch of guys wanted to refuse. And um, they were going back and forth, we're not going down, and Captain Hawkins went down with a bunch of new guys in the other platoon, and we had no choice but to follow them, mm -hmm. and we all thought it was wrong. And that's kind of like my first impression of Chuck Hawkins, mm -hmm. I think he, he, he's not too smart, mm -hmm. <laughs> or he's trying to be too brave. <coughs> and that went on. But it did turn out at that point that he was right, or at least... He was very right. Yeah. He was smart. He was very... I didn't realize till afterwards how smart he was. Mm -hmm. And that's because I didn't know anything. All right. Now, did with Hawkins as your commander, did, you have, did he push you harder than Burkhardt had, or did you have to move farther or faster? Or was that really even hard to measure because things were changing? It's hard to measure. I, I couldn't even tell. Yeah. Okay. I like Burkhart. Mm -hmm. Burkhart, for some reason, <clears throat> maybe because of the timing, but I felt safe with Burkhart. I thought he was a good commander. I didn't interact with him at yeah. all. Um, well, there were commanders who made it a point to try to get their men out alive. They, that, Jeff Wilcox was that kind of person. Uh, and then that may have registered. This was not a guy who was doing stupid things, uh, and he knew what he was doing. Yeah, and so Hawkins is maybe in, in certain ways more gung ho or something, or at least he's giving you that impression. He gave me that impression, whether it was right or wrong or whatever. I learned to love Hawkins afterwards, but at the time I was trying, I would second guess what mm -hmm. we were doing. 
Um, you know, just more was happening to us under Hawkins yeah. than Burkhart. Right. Yeah. And so it made, I, that would make a difference. That would be, a, you make that association. Yeah. Um, before we get into the kind of climax there uh, of the Ripcord campaign, talk a little bit more about just, just the physical conditions of being out in the field uh, in Vietnam at that point. Um, you know, just, but down to the level, you mean like, you know, what are you eating or how do you get supplied or just physically what condition were you in? I, I must have been in pretty good condition because I, my weight on the back, the rock, you know, carrying 80, 90 pounds mm -hmm. of, on my back and walking up straight up hills and straight down hills, um, I had to be in pretty good condition. My head always, like I said, I always had a, excuse me, always had a fear. Uh, wait, go ahead, you can actually, I have to pause this now anyway. So we were talking just about what it was like to be out kind of humping it in, in the jungle uh, in that kind of late spring summer of 1970 and the conditions you were encountering. So you were talking, physically you were getting in pretty good shape because you had to be carried, you were carrying all of that stuff and you had not fallen over and collapsed yet. Uh, did people get that kind of tropical diseases and things, the jungle rot? And I had jungle rot. I had jungle rot from here to here on my arms and the bottom of my legs. I had jungle rot once and had to go in and get treated and they gave me medicine and wrapped it and sent me back to the field. And you get those, those kinds of infections and things. Uh, I, I had ringworm, um, yeah they called it ringworm mm -hmm. and then I had leeches. I might have had 80 leeches on my leg at one time from when you wrap up in the heat and if it's damp and the leeches, how, how they got on you but everybody had leeches on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you get rid of a leech? Uh, with insecticide, you squirt them and then they would just fall over dead. Okay, so bug spray works, all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, and were you just living off of, of, of sea rations or? Just sea rations, every once in a while we got lucky and got a lerp, which is dehydrated in a bag and you would pour hot water on it and. That was the best you can have over there, but basically it was sea rations all, all right. day long. Okay, and then when you're in the field, do you have to uh, police yourselves in terms of the noise you make or the trash you leave behind or anything else like that? Yes, uh, <clears throat> you try to clean up as much as you can. Um, you, you just gotta be careful on everything you did you know, when we pack up, but they knew we were there. Mm -hmm. I know they knew what we were there. And if you read uh, Ben Harrison's Hell on a Hilltop, some nights we'd take a position and they were right underneath of us. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it at the time. All right, now, did you ever stay uh, the same place for more than one night, at least. Very, before. very rarely. I, I can't recall. If you did, maybe once or twice, but never, never stayed at a place. Mm -hmm. And that's what killed me. Every morning, you get up and you move out, and then you'd set up at night, and the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, get to about the eighteenth of July. That's when a Chinook helicopter crashes on top of the Ripcord base and blows up the ammunition for yeah, the... Yeah, we were out there then and watched it. Okay. Uh, and, and did you... what? Were you watching helicopters go in or did you hear the noise and then look? The smoke. Okay. We could see the smoke and the flames and everything at mm -hmm. that time. All right. And did you find out at that time what happened? Somebody down the line would let us know what it was going on. All right. But you were, and even after that happens, though, you're still out patrolling in the jungle. Yes. Uh, but now you start, you get into a situation that'll lead to kind of your. Now it's getting really hairy out there. There's all of them walking around. Um, we're picking them off here and there. 
and then might have been the 18th we hit the wire line we we tapped the wire line we came across the wire line and our uh, interpreter that was with the company CP he took somebody's earphones that they had for their radio and connected it to the wire line and his face went you know like crazy and what he said was we out there Alpha Company was in between two base camps of NBA soldiers mm -hmm. we were smack in the middle of them and they were sending guys down to check the wire line they had a break in the wire line and they were sending a guy from each camp down to see where it broke and they set us up on the line they sent my squad and a couple other guys one guy had a AK-47 we had captured, maybe two of them, and they were supposed to fire first, mm -hmm. and the machine gunner, and they put me right on top of the line, and uh, a couple of other guys out there with 16s, mm -hmm. and this big guy come walking down the line, and I could see his head over the bushes. And I said, you know, there he is. And the lieutenant came up and tapped me on the ass and said, where, no, he said, where's he at? And I said, he went down. Because they all, everybody opened up on the guy. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the machine gunner, the, the AKs, the uh, M16s. And he went down right in front of me. So the lieutenant came up and he said, where's he at? And I said, he went down right over there and pointed in that direction. And he tapped me on the ass and said, go ahead, we'll follow you. I rolled over because I was in a prone position. I rolled over. I said, I got to 79. I can't go first. So then he just went by me and got the other, uh, somebody else, and they chased this guy because nobody got him. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got him. They hit him. He was bleeding like crazy. And they followed the blood trail down into the river and lost them. Because mm -hmm. at that time, they wanted us to take a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And they wanted him as a prisoner, but they couldn't find him. Right. Okay. So, uh, you, you find this communications line. And then, did you stay there? Did you continue to tap into it? Yes until the guy came down and we shot him up. Then we got out of there. Okay, you did, you did leave at that point. Yeah, we left that area. Yeah. And how, how long did you stay where the wire was, do you think? I'm not sure. Okay. I know we were there a while. And were you there like a couple hours or overnight or? No, I don't think we stayed overnight. Okay. All right. Uh, so that happens and then what comes after that? Well, we went, that was one day, and then uh, we walked around a little bit, and <clears throat> up and down, or whatever else we were going. And then on the morning of the 22nd, um, they evacuated, they were evacuating all the line companies out of the area. Right. Alpha Company's the only one left in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said on the morning of the 22nd, they were going to pull us out. So they wanted us to go one direction to get it to a uh, LZ, and they were going to get us out of the area. So as we were walking, first, first platoon started to walk down the direction we were going to go. We had two Kit Carson scouts with us. They both led both squads down the hill. Somehow, whatever happened, the two squads, the two point men were Kit Carson scouts, mm -hmm. and they walked into each other, and we started shooting at each other. Right away, we started yelling or whatever, and they knew it was us, mm -hmm. and the shooting stopped. And right then, Hawkins calls us back up to the top of the hill. 
So we turn around and get back up to the top of the hill. <clears throat> That's when they said, they sent Lee's platoon. As we were walking up, they sent Lee's platoon in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Now this is when it, where it gets a little hairy. Lucas called Chuck and told him, Hawkins and told him to go in the other direction. Hawkins is fighting with Lucas that we cannot go in that direction because they're following us. They know where we're at. We got to get the hell out of here and we got to get out of here now. Chuck Hawkins wanted to go the way we were supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Lucas is yelling at him not to and hangs up on him. And Lucas being the battalion commander. Yes. Yeah, just for the reference of anyone from the outside. Okay. Yes. And what happens at that point is as Lee's moving down in the direction Lucas wants him to go, mm -hmm. he runs in. The NBA surrounded us. There were 76 of us in our company. And the NBA had us surrounded by three sides. And they start lobbing mortars on us. And as soon as we heard the mortars, everybody jumps off the top of the hill to get cover. And we were clusterfucked. We were clustered. And um, it was just a mess where everybody was at. Second platoon, Lee's platoon was down the <coughs> side of the hill getting hit. He walked right into them. And they were up on top of the hill before the mortars even stopped. And that's when I got hit in the arm with a piece of shrapnel that ripped my arm up and my muscle on my arm. And I went down. No, I'm sorry. First I got hit with a... Uh, Satchel charge. I went over to the medic was laying on the ground and I went over to him. And as I, I'm over to him, a satchel charge was thrown at us. And when it went off, it blew off in my face and I rolled back down the hill. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I rolled into Hawkins and his CP. And I had a slight concussion. I couldn't see or hear. And somebody smacked me and put the helmet back on my head. And, I guess because I was just so scared that I was fine and I start running back up the hill and that's when I got hit in the arm with the shrapnel. And at that point, that's when Martin Glennon comes over. Martin says it was him that came over to me. Mm -hmm. I don't remember which money mm -hmm. came over to me. I didn't think he was with us. I thought he was down with 2nd Platoon, with Lee's with, Platoon. He was with Lee's Platoon, yeah. Yeah. But at the reunion, she said it was him that wrapped me up. It might have been later and That's afterwards. Right, yeah, yeah. But another medic came over and wrapped me real quick. He only had one little bandage left and wrapped my arm up. And <clears throat> Tommy Webster and them were running by and told me to run with them up the hill. They would take, they would lead in the charge. Tommy Webster led the charge up the hill. Uh, him and couple other guys that were there and as they were running up the hill and I started to get up and run over there then I got hit in the ankle with more shrapnel my ankle bone took a hit and I went down now this is the third time I got hit mm -hmm. and I'm totally I'm out of it I'm done I'm, I'm like you know what's going to happen where am I going to go I, I don't know what the heck to do and Collie Shelton, Sheldon, he picked me up and grabbed me and carried me up behind a tree and said, get down to dropping the bomb. And the next thing I know, <clears throat> the bomb landed right on top of us almost, and it left me a few feet off the ground. I mean, I actually was raised off the ground when it hit. And that kind of scared the NBA away. Yeah. The bomb is from an American fighter jet yes. coming in close. Chuck, yes. was, Chuck was calling in directions of the uh, 250 pound bombs. Mm -hmm. And as he was calling them up, they still, the NBA wasn't leaving. And Chuck finally said, You got to drop it higher. 
somehow between their communication, I don't know what their communication was, but Chuck was demanding that he dropped it closer to right. us. And he did. Mm -hmm. They dropped it closer, and that's the one that saved our lives. Because yeah. there were standard rules that the Air Force pilots had to follow about how far away from our own positions they could drop the bombs. And, and this was violating those rules, um, but the NBA also knew what the rules were. So if Chuck hadn't called it in, then it wouldn't have worked. Right. Yeah. And that's, and it worked because it scared them off. Now, they all left and we went around, picked up, you know, the wounded, and they carried me over to a spot. <clears throat> and I stayed there for the night, mm -hmm. and as we were there for the night, I don't think anybody slept. Chuck Hawkins says he, he got a couple hours sleep or whatever else. And I don't know how. I was so scared and I had my adrenaline, everything. I mean, I just didn't know what was going to go down. Are they going to come back? Can they hit us again? Mm -hmm. We only got maybe 12 guys that can fight out of 76. Mm -hmm. We had 14 dead, 56 wounded. I mean, how are we going to defend ourselves? And the boat, the ships off sea were dropping illumination. Illumination rounds, yeah. The rounds to light up. And the canisters are falling down on top of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm like, we just can't win. <laughs> and we waited until the morning. And I remember in the morning when the uh, Delta Company came in. Mm -hmm. And they, they got landed somewhere on another LZ, and then they walked over to us. And it didn't seem like that long, but could have been forever. Um, and they came up, and they had to blow the trees down to make an LZ for us to get out, because they couldn't carry us out. Too many wounded, too many dead, mm -hmm. so they blew the trees off right there. Okay, and the North Vietnamese left you alone at this point? They weren't even around. Now, at this point, that was also when the evacuation of the fire base was going on. Yes. Yeah, they may have been distracted. They, well, from what I understand, the NBA either thought we were all dead, okay, or they didn't care about us because they, they hit us bad enough that that was a distraction. Yeah. And they just left to go over and they wanted to take the fire base. Mm -hmm. And they had, and all the MBA that were around us were called in to go over there. Mm -hmm. So they all start running over towards the fire base. We were left alone. How? Why? When they threw me on a helicopter, because the helicopters could only come straight down. Mm -hmm. And they threw me on <clears throat> and the scariest moment in my life, and in Vietnam, with everything that happened to me, was that lift off because the helicopter had to take its time going up because of the trees mm -hmm. until they got above all the trees and then just took off like a dart out of hell. And that's when my stomach was like, okay. And then I got back to Evans. All right. Now, at that point, did they dispatch you up there and send you back to the unit, or what happens to you? They looked at everybody. Uh, Doc Harris and his medics were there at the helicopter. Yeah, and he's a battalion doctor. Yes, and they, they checked everybody that was coming with me off the helicopters. And they checked me and said, I'm going right to... Uh, Da Nang, maybe the 85th in Da Nang, and they sent me right to there. And then when I got to there, uh, that's when they did surgery on my arm and patched up my knee, uh, put some stuff on my face, mm -hmm. and I stayed there overnight. And then I left the next morning, they sent me down to the 483rd Air Force Hospital. And I stayed there about four weeks, maybe. All right. And where was that, you know? In Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay, okay. The 483rd. And then from there, they sent me to the convalescent center, which was right next door for maybe uh, another two weeks. So it was like a total of six weeks I was in the hospital. 
All right. How close are you at this point to the end of your tour? I got two weeks left. Okay. So what do you do in the last two weeks? Burnt shit, detail, and night guard duty. Because I had pulled from home. They, my mother got the telegram the day I got hit. <clears throat> it said, your son has been wounded, he's in the inventory condition. She was so scared from what she heard on the radio about troops up north, and she was shaken up and she had a premonition and something happened to me, that she thought I was amputated when she read the uh, telegram. Mm -hmm. She called the congressman she went to school with. He said, I'll take uh, care of it, and he sent a liaison, he got a liaison going over. Mm -hmm. Vietnam that was over there to check it out. Mm -hmm. Well, he got back to my mother, he told her <clears throat> what he found out was that was the third time I was wounded. Mm -hmm. And the liaison went up to see the uh, top, the sergeant major that was in the clerk up there. Mm -hmm. And he told her that Hawkins wanted me back out in the field as soon as I got back. And the liaison